Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. You are listening to The Robbie Rowe Show, episode 83 with Tyler Ansman. Let's hear a little sound bite from Tyler from today's episode. You know, like major, you know, uh, mobility deficiencies in the guy you're working with. And then from there, you can go and try to change certain pieces uh, within the delivery. So like it might be, you know, somebody's lead leg block is, is bad, which would basically mean like when they land instead of so when you land, your knee is probably going to be like a little bit flexed. But as or bent, but as you uh, start to accelerate your arm, what's going to happen is that leg is is going to extend more. So your knee is going to have less of a bend to it and more stiffness. So like if you see Justin Verlander, right, he's got like a very famous lead leg block because he almost hyperextends. I have your attention. Give me my knee here. Now listen to Clear the Mechanism. The Robbie Rose Show. The Robbie Rose Show. <laughs> Yo, what it is, guys. Wow, I just said what it is. I never say what it is. Well, I just did. So, hey, what's up? It's Robbie Rowland, the host of The Robbie Rowe Show, the podcast that you are listening to. Hey, real quick, so I got a new mic. <laughs> mic number 733 of my podcasting experience. And I've recorded this podcast with Tyler Ansman with this mic. So if there's any complications, like I played it back on my end and it doesn't, honestly, it doesn't sound as good as like, I feel like my, my headset that I had been using sounds, but, um, I use it anyways. I might, I might just, I might just trash it. I don't know. I might, I might bang it, but I, uh, wanted to see, I'm using it right now. So with that being said, I apologize if the sound quality isn't up to par, but, um, you know, it's still, this is going to be a really good episode. Tyler is a uh, current, it's funny, him and I are like in actually very similar positions. I think we're very, very passionate about very similar things, right? So as far as like baseball, um, pitching specific, you know, he's a pitcher himself, current free agent. He'll talk about his journey and his backstory in the show, so I won't spoil it too much. But uh, he actually is a, a current strength conditioning guy as well that's training a lot of athletes. So it's cool that he's still in the game and still giving back um, to to other players and training other players too. So uh, it's definitely fun to talk to a like-minded individual. Uh, I think that's kind of the coolest part about actually podcasting is – getting to have these kind of conversations and then give it to you guys, like bring that episode to you guys. So um, go ahead and head over to the show notes to get all of the links um, that's talked about in this episode. I know we mentioned Ben Brewster. He was on the show. I'll link that podcast in the show notes. Uh, link can be found the Robbie Rose show.com. That's Robbie with a Y forward slash zero eight three forward slash zero eight three so that'll be the show notes uh you can head over there and check out all of tyler ansman's links he's got a website instagram twitter facebook tyler ansman performance is going to be his website um he's a real one man i mean it's definitely fun talking to him like you heard in the soundbite like dude knows his stuff he's been through it he's been to the texas baseball ranch he's been to the florida baseball ranch he's been around guys that uh, that are highly regarded in the industry, so it's it's absolute pleasure to have them on the Ravi Rose Show. So, um, if you guys are new to the show, go ahead and hit that subscribe button as I bring you guys as many guests as I possibly can that provide solid content, solid insight on how to better um, you know better approach your baseball development or your son's baseball development or just optimize your life in general. Um, try to bring as much. Uh, podcast content as I as I possibly can. You can check me out on Instagram, Robbie Row One Two. Again, Robbie with a Y, and my website, which offers mechanical analysis, online coaching plans, um, can be found at therobbyrowshow dot com. All right, ladies and gentlemen, my introduction is done, um, and I, I I really think that this is going to be a, a, a phenomenal episode for you guys to uh to tune into so appreciate you guys like i said if you haven't uh if you have yet to hit that subscribe button on this podcast be sure to do so to not miss out on any quality information that is to be had okay i'm out enjoy the episode much love um probably talk to you after the show okie dokie enjoy episode 83 of the robbie Rowe show with tyler ansman all right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of The Robbie Rose Show, episode 83. I'm with Tyler Ansman. And, dude, Tyler, I totally forgot. Like, I do this all the time. Like, 
Did I pronounce your last name right, Tyler? You Anson? did. You got it right. Yep, you got it right. All right, dude. Well, hey, welcome to the show, man. Like I said before we hopped on here, appreciate you taking the time coming on. And um, how, how's everything going today? How you doing? That's good, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, absolutely. So you're coming from Baltimore, Maryland. Is your favorite movie uh, Hairspray? <laughs> it is not. I have never seen Hairspray, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, no, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> is that weird that that's the first thing I thought about was like the movie Hairspray? Yeah. No, because that's that's like a that's like a, a super Baltimore thing, right? That's that's like Hamden, which is one of the neighborhoods in the city, is like oh, okay. old school. Baltimore, and that's where that movie kind of takes place. So I think probably a decent amount of people probably associate Baltimore with that. Yeah, well, I mean, as long as that didn't make me didn't make me weird in my audience. No, so. <laughs> no. All right, so are you, are you an Orioles fan? Uh, kind of. I mean, to be honest with you, like I'm not I'm not really a fan of any team in particular. Like I appreciate different players individually, but I don't really I don't really have like a rooting interest to be honest with you in baseball. Right. No, I'm the same way. I mean, once you like once you get to that point, I feel like. At that age, you know, you, you just like you just appreciate the game as a whole. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Um, but as as a kid, like, I mean, you grew up there, right? I did, yeah. So as a kid, I was I was definitely an Orioles fan. I was a big uh, Mike Messina, uh, Cal Ripken, Brady Anderson guy. So um, I, that was, I mean, the Orioles were really really good when I was very young, like in the in the mid to late nineties. Right. Um, and then they steadily did not stay as good after that. So. Right. Um, but yeah, no, I mean it's it's uh, Camden Yards is a super nice stadium, so going to games there is a good time. Um, I live very close to the stadium, so it's not hard to get over there. Uh, but yeah, no, not not really like a super big fan of any team in particular. I was a uh, I was a I was an Orioles fan for like one or two seasons. Um, <laughs> so my boy uh, Miguel Tejada, dude, when he when, yeah. he, when he went over there, um, started watching more games, and uh, and dude, uh, who was it? Brian Roberts, second base, gamer. Stud. Yeah. Um, who else? Jay Gibbons. I'm like, yep. I'm like trying to name a pitcher. Like I can't think. Of that. <laughs> um, but uh, anyways, dude, let's let's hop right into it, man. Let's. Uh, I'm like super super intrigued about like your story because obviously we go we kind of got introduced to each other via Instagram, um, and uh, you go to your page and it's like okay, so CSCS strength coach. Uh, strength and conditioning guy uh, still currently playing that's kind of like the broad thing take us in like let's fully dive into Tyler Ansman and and uh, let's let's hear the whole journey as far as like being a ball player and and how that got to you it's like where you are at now okay yeah absolutely um, so so currently I am a free agent so I still am trying to play Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, right now it's basically like, I know I'm going to have to put up some ridiculous velocity numbers alongside, um, like a pretty epic slider as well, Mm -hmm. um, to get a shot somewhere. So I'm, I'm training towards that and I'm also running, uh, my company, Tyler Ann's performance. So I train, uh, mostly baseball players at this point, generally pitchers specifically, but I have, I have some infielders and outfielders who I also work with as far as like the skill work on throwing goes and also, um, kind of in the weight room and on the more general side of things as well. Uh, but so to kind of backtrack a little bit from where I am now. Mm-hmm. So when I was coming up, I, I knew for a long time that I wanted to play baseball whatever at whatever level I possibly could. Um, you know, when I was younger, I was generally one of the better kids on the team. Like I threw pretty hard. I got to high school. I was throwing pretty hard, but then kind of eventually hit that point where like I just wasn't throwing any harder. I didn't really know what to do. Like um, I unfortunately at that point wasn't like intellectually curious enough to kind of fall down my own rabbit holes and figure out where I needed to go. So it was mm-hmm. like, I basically just banged my head against the wall for, you know, the next few years after that, basically fast forward to like my senior year of college, I played at a small division three and I basically, I left high school throw in low to mid eighties, left college throw in, you know, mid to high eighties on a good day. Um, but knew I like wasn't done with baseball and I really hadn't given it like my best shot that I possibly could. So I decided I wanted to keep playing. I knew indie ball was probably going to be the route I had to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but at that point, I was like, I've got to figure some stuff out for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had spent college basically getting really strong. So I had, I had gone basically really, really far on the general side and didn't do enough specific skill work, right? So right. Um, like I was strong. I was reasonably powerful, not not super powerful. Uh, but I was, I was really strong, so I, I kind of gotten as strong as I really realistically needed to get Mm -hmm. uh but my my movement on the mound and just like through general throwing patterns was just garbage so as most of us um, (laughs) yeah yeah so 
so kind of sought out other information. I went to uh, the Texas baseball ranch at one point. One of my one of my teammates lived out in Houston, so I went and stayed with him for a week and trained out there for a week. We basically like I lived at his parents' house for a week. We would go there and basically train all day every day. I took with me some good stuff from there um, and ended up playing in the Pecos League for a little bit that like that following spring. So that was like in the winter and I've played there in the spring. So um, by this point I had like gotten up to like maybe touching 90 miles an hour and I'm like 22 or 23 years old and like knew I just needed way more if I was going to play at the level that I wanted to play at, which was affiliate ball because anyone who's played indie ball knows that like that is not the destination by any means. Like you're hoping to pass through there as quickly as you can. Right. So, um, Mm -hmm. so get through there, basically continue on. I, I, met up with this awesome physical therapist in Philadelphia. His name was Phil Donnelly. And he had been, he was like kind of one of the first guys to kind of like push stuff in the direction that it is now, as far as it goes with like the specifics of throwing. I mean, obviously like Paul Nyman and Ron Wolforth and those guys were, were there as well. Right. But Phil was kind of the guy like where we, when we see elbow injuries now, we know that it's probably something more proximal that's causing the pain or the injury there. So like it's probably coming from like the shoulder scapular complex kind of area, right? Some right. somewhere in like the thorax is probably what's causing the problem to the more distal region that is the elbow. Like that just happens to be like the, uh, the most likely part to break in a lot of guys, right? So he was kind of the guy who started down that path. So um, I ended up working with him for a while, um, which was awesome. Played a little more indie ball for a couple years. At this point, my velocity had gotten pretty good. I threw for some affiliated teams. Nothing really came of it because I was like 24, 25, throwing like, you know, 90 to 93 when I would throw for these teams. It just wasn't quite good enough. So I played a little more indie ball, ended up getting released from one of the teams, and I went down to the Florida Baseball Ranch for a while. And so I was there, uh, I ran like the strength conditioning side of everything for them and then trained. So like I would train basically all day and then I would do the strength conditioning stuff and and help with throwing stuff at night because by that point I was already, uh, when I was back home in the off seasons, I was doing uh, more personal training stuff, just enough that basically I could pay my bills when I went away and played and got the, you know, the minor league salary kind of thing. Oh yeah, grinding. Uh, Yeah. So, so uh, when I went down there, I basically, like, they needed some help with that, and I needed a way to be able to train, like, there. So I did that in exchange for being able to train there, which was an awesome experience. Got to learn a lot about throwing because to that point I really wasn't, like, a big skill guy. Like, I knew I needed to work on that, but I had no idea how to teach it. Um, So that that helped me learn a lot and kind of form my own model for training a little bit because they do some really awesome things down there, and then there were some things that I thought, like, maybe I could improve upon. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of, like, took that with me. And continue to learn. Um, I met up with uh, Ben Brewster of Tread. Not yeah, too long he was on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's he's actually from my area. Yeah. Uh, and so I just I kind of like reached out to him and I was like, hey man, like I'm throwing pretty hard. I'd like to get in front of some teams. You know, could we chat? And he I had sent him a video to like prove that I threw hard. Um, and and he called me and was like, hey, I'm going to be in Baltimore like in the next couple of days. Let's train together. And I was like, all right, cool. So we went to the facility, we, we threw a little bit, we lifted together, um, and just kind of like became friends. He was a super knowledgeable guy, way, way far ahead of where I was at that time in terms of knowledge. Right. So I, I learned a lot from him. Again, kind of like went back to the drawing board, improved my training model a little bit. Again, thought like I would probably change some things from the way he thought, and that's not anything against him. It's just like we have different ideas about some sure. things, which is, which is totally good. Um, so that helped, and then I continued training kind of – tested everything on myself in terms of like what worked what didn't because i had some ideas in terms of like what i thought key performance indicators would be for like taking velocity to the mound as far as like what i did in the gym and so i was like let's see if i improve this number if that improves my velocity and like some of it did some of it didn't and then kind of like went from there with that so that's a super long way of saying how i got to where i am now but that basically kind of brings it to where no, we go. No, dude, that's that's fantastic. And I like I want to unpack a lot of that stuff cuz you said like hey, a bunch of good little nuggets. <laughs> um dude, yeah, no. First of all, Ben's awesome. Um yeah, like yeah, I said, he's, he's on the he came on the show. I'll link that uh, I'll link that episode in the show notes for this episode as well. Um but uh I want to I'm curious like was was strength and conditioning always something like even when you were growing up was something that you were going to no matter what, like get into, or was it baseball and then training or was it training then baseball? 
Yeah, so I think it, I think it was baseball and then training. Um, so I I like I liked the gym a lot when I was younger. I didn't necessarily really know what I was doing, but um, I was willing to work. Like I was always the guy who was in the gym all the time. Like probably to the detriment of my my playing career to some degree. Like through college, I was probably pretty well overtrained for like a lot of my college career. So I never like fully expressed like maybe what my best velocity was on the mound in the game because I would still. Like, at this point, I didn't really know what in-season training was when I was in college, so sure. I would just train, like, my same off-season stuff, which, again, the volume was stupid at that point. Like, I, I really, I can't stress enough that I did not know what I was doing when I was in college, but, um, hmm. so my volume, my volume was nuts, my intensity was high, and, like, it's really hard to do both of those things, and then on top of that, also play well in games, um, and then I was trying to do a lot of throwing stuff on top of that, just, like, all of it was, was too much, um, so when I kind of figured out what the right recipe was for kind of mixing it all together and making it work and still being able to like perform well. Uh, I took like leaps and bounds ahead of where I had been relatively quickly. Once I kind of got that all together. What's going on guys. Sorry to interrupt the show, but uh, I want to give this opportunity to talk about a sponsor of the Robbie Rose show and pocket radar. If you're interested in getting a discount on Pocket Radar, head over to the show notes, therobbyroshow.com forward slash 083, and claim your discount. Let's get back to the show. Did you break down? I mean, knowing that your like volume was like super yeah. high, or did, did, you, did yeah, you respond so, pretty well? Uh, at first, I responded pretty well. So I made like I made newbie gains, obviously, like everybody does in the in the very beginning, where like my numbers in the gym just like went through the roof once I started like doing big movements pretty consistently. Mm-hmm. Um, but it got to the point pretty quickly because I was trying to do that and then also do like a lot of intense throwing volume, um, like max long toss, like, you know, three, four or five days a week, which Love like it. for me doesn't doesn't work very well. Like I, I am a guy who does better with lower volume and like higher intensity. Um, but I didn't know that then. Uh, so, yeah. Can, so, you, can you explain uh, that for like my listeners, like actually what that like looks like as far as um, you, you mentioned, like lower volume, but higher intensity? Yeah, for sure. So. Um, if we think about it in terms of like the gym, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're gonna if you're gonna lift really heavy weights, you're not gonna be able to do it for the same number of reps that you would be if you lifted relatively lighter weights. So if we think about it on the on the scale of like a, a one rep max, right? A one rep max is by definition the amount of weight you can do for one repetition, right? So it's the most weight you could possibly lift in that given movement. So basically intensity goes down from there as you go higher in repetitions, right? Because it has to, because otherwise, you know, your one rep max would be higher or whatever. So basically volume and intensity, uh, have to work against each other more or less. So the more intensity you do, the less volume you can do and vice versa. So if you're going to lift really heavy stuff, you can't go crazy with your volume and try to do, you know, uh, 20 sets of three or something like that on, on like a, a three RM deadlift. Mm-hmm. Like you're just going to be smoked physiologically and neurologically. So like you just won't be able to, cause like ultimately what we do in the gym, we want that to carry over to our skill work. Right. Mm-hmm. And if we're smoking ourselves in the gym, then we can't do high quality skill work. So like those things need to work together. So, so basically again, like I said, the more intensity you're doing, the less volume you should be doing and vice versa. So, so that, that like correlated to your, like correlate that to your throwing, right? So like, yeah. As far as like max long toss, or you know, uh, I don't know if like you were a run and gun guy or pull down guy. Yeah. So so in terms of that, right? So like in general, for pretty much all of my guys, no one has more than two high intensity days in a week, and so that could be a variety of things, right? So um, you know, a max effort uh, velocity bullpen, you know, where you're throwing where you're throwing 15 or 20 pitches or something like that, that yeah. could be one high intensity day. Plyo testing could be one high intensity day. Pull downs could be a high intensity day. Max long toss, any of those things. But no one's getting more than two of those. And for the most part, I generally stay around one just because then we can get in more of like pretty much all of the guys I'm getting need a significant amount of patterning work. Like they have deficiencies in their movement somewhere and we need time to kind of work on that. And high intensity work can be helpful along with the patterning stuff, but like by itself, is generally not enough for most guys because they're underlying deficiencies that like just don't allow them to kind of move the way we want them to, right? So we have to fix their mobility, we have to fix their um, strength, we have to fix their like specific patterning work. Like even once the mobility is there, we have to kind of work on those things. Just like a run and gun isn't going to automatically make everyone self organized to like their highest uh, velocity delivery, right? Like we're probably going to do other specific stuff within there. Um, mm. So for me, it was like a matter of going from trying to max long toss four days a week or five days a week to going to like 
maybe a Monday and Friday are like my high effort days. And then the days in between, I'm doing like some low and moderate intensity stuff. And then I'm building back up to that kind of like in a wave formation, right? So like right. I would go high intensity throwing and then either low intensity or no throwing. And then I would go like moderate intensity and then either a low or moderate day again and then high again and then kind of repeat that pattern basically into the next week. And like that worked so much better for me. Basically like taking taking some of that time down to like kind of let my body recover. Basically taking a, a deload from throwing and then coming back just my numbers like shot up. Like I went from I went from probably like, you know, sniffing 90 miles an hour to then all of a sudden I was touching 93 miles an hour mm-hmm. in like the span of like a couple of weeks just with tweaking my volume because I had at that point I've been working on the patterning stuff for a while. I just wasn't quite where I needed to be in terms of like the volume. So, yeah, no what I love about that and what you said is like identifying your sweet spot, right? Like the identification of like what it's going to take for you to essentially reach your goals. Right. So like, I think there's a lot of kids out there that, you know, um, get into a habit and I don't think it's their fault. Like obviously social media has a huge presence on this, but they look at like other people. Um, and then they go, Oh, well this works for this person. Like I'll just do this and then I'll be good. Well, yeah. And sorry to interrupt the show, but we got to hear from some advertisers. Yay. And so individualization is huge. Right. And the other thing is that, like, we're talking about kids looking at what pro guys are doing, and it's going to be very different. So right. when we when we kind of talk about that volume and intensity thing again, basically, like, the, the stronger you are, the more powerful you are, the harder you throw, whatever, basically the more stress you create every time you do that thing at max effort. So, like, if somebody throws 95 miles an hour versus somebody throwing 65 miles an hour, like, the person who throws 95 can probably do that less times than the person can throw 65 miles an hour. Like you can see little leaguers, they like if you see them, they probably can go out and throw five days a week as hard as they want to, mm-hmm. and they will probably feel fine and like most likely recover fine. I'm not saying they should do that, but they'd be fine. If you had a big leaguer like Aroldis go out and throw 100 miles an hour five days in a row, like it just bad things probably would happen to him, or they would at least be more likely to happen to him. And at the very least, his performance would probably decrease. Right? There's like a reason you don't generally see relievers throw more than two days in a row and at the very most they throw three days in a row and that just doesn't happen very often right like they you need a recovery piece to that and when we're in game like you also have the the high neural component of being in a pressure situation a lot of times so so like we're, we're combining all these things and that and the intensity just takes takes longer to recover from the better you are at that thing right the higher your performance level is more or less yeah and 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 that's why like i love doing these podcasts man to like bring like shed light on a lot of these topics because there's like this is you know i i kind of get a bad rep for like harping on the millennials and everything but like (laughs) i would be doing the same thing if i lived you know if i was 12 years old in 2019 just because we have so much access to information at the fingertips you know what i mean so it's kind of hard to unpack like all of the information that's out there and that's why I think it's and I'm always going to encourage guys to like seek out individuals like yourself because it's not the 12 to 15 year olds um, fault for not identifying like the sweet spot for himself right like that's why it's about hey you know if you're serious about you know being a high level high school player or D1 college player or professional player, like then these are going to be the steps that you got to take. And that's getting yourself into, you know, training things like, like yourself and, uh, and start that identification process. But on that topic, as far as like the identification process, is that something that you're doing like in a screening with athletes, like script watching them throw and then watching them train like, okay, you know, Tommy over here is going to need more patterning. He's got inefficient arm patterning and, and his lower body's not working with his upper body. And then Billy over here actually like looks and moves pretty well. So like yeah. he's going to be more of like an intent guy where, Hey, we just need to break those mental barriers. Like take us through that process for you, if you don't mind. Yeah. So for sure. So, so the first thing that any athlete goes through, whether they're training with me remotely or in person is we go through, like a full movement and mobility assessment. Basically, we're looking for like baseline ranges of motion, passively and actively, Mm -hmm. and we're looking for like specific movement patterns they can get in and out of. Um, And then we'll do a mechanical analysis with that. So we'll get specific views of them um, throwing from the mound, and then we'll kind of match those two things up, right? So like if we're looking at somebody and we're like, oh man, his hip-shoulder separation sucks, and then we see that on his mobility screen, like, oh, he's missing hip internal rotation and he's missing, you know, thoracic uh, rotation mobility to his arm side, then we're like, okay, well, clearly we need to, like, work on the mobility before we can really pattern anything. And then, excuse me, and then if uh, 
if we see another guy and his his you know mobility is totally fine and he's still like deficient in this pattern, then we're like, okay, we just need to pattern it more. Like we need to find a way to put him in a position to feel this and maybe give him a model so that he can kind of like see it in his mind for for what that looks like to him, and then we can kind of let him run with it and kind of he'll hopefully get into those better positions otherwise we'll kind of tweak what we're doing with him until he does find those better positions so that's that's what we would do as far as the patterning goes um and then as far as the other stuff goes so like i'm also getting everybody's baseline strength numbers their baseline power numbers and all that kind of stuff so we can kind of see where we need to go with that right. if somebody's i mean if somebody's you know already deadlifting 500 pounds and they can work with you know 120 pound dumbbells for sets of five on dumbbell bench like we probably don't need to work on strength too too much yeah. but if they're still throwing 85 miles an hour clearly there's, there's some issues there yeah. right so like yeah so it could be again mobility it could be patterning it could be you know their their power is really low and we just need to bring them to the to the other side of the force velocity curve and that will do wonders for them like it could be a variety of things but yeah we're we're absolutely identifying that in our screening process so we know kind of like where we're going with different guys because not absolutely everybody is going to train in different ways and we won't know what way that is until we get all the information from them and go through the screen. No, nah, dude, I love it because it takes the guessing out of it, right? Like For sure. You, you, you can look at like anyone and be like, oh, well, he, he does something good because he throws 90, but it's like... Yeah. If you look at another guy, he's on seventy-eight. Like, okay, well, where is it at? Like, under what's the underlying deficiency that's prohibiting this individual from doing what he wants to do on the mound? And that's what I, sure. I'm such a big proponent of, like that identification process of, like, okay, look at his mobility. Is it mobility? Can he move through time and space efficiently? Okay, is his strength numbers? Where's his format? Like, there's so many other like components, yeah. and sometimes it sucks too, right? Because you get these kids who are listening in on this show, and they're like, wow, that's you know, you have XYZ, freaking ABC, like all of these different components that we need to look at. And they could be like, wow, that's, that's a lot, right? Like that's a lot of work. But at the end of yeah. the day, if you want to be great, these are the things that you got to like check off, right? Like, Oh, hundred percent. And it's, and it's not like we're ever like, we're generally not trying to do all of these things at one time. Like sure. we're trying to build, we're trying to build a base of all these things. So like if I get, if I get a kid who's 12 years old and he's deficient in patterning, but he also has never trained today in his life and he's super weak and doesn't move well, like we're, we're probably going to hit the, the low hanging fruit, which is the, the general stuff first. Like we're going to work on his movement patterns. We're going to work on his strength levels. We're going to make sure that like, he's a really good general mover mm-hmm. before we get like super, super specific with what we do in terms of throwing, right? Because things are going to change once he gets stronger, more mobile, more athletic, gets more comfortable with his body and that kind of thing and understands like how to move different pieces at different times. He basically gets that like kinesthetic awareness. Like once that happens, things, things change like greatly. So, um, it really, it really depends on, on the guy, like where you're going to go with that. But the other thing is it can feel overwhelming, but but basically, we're just trying to, like, lay one perfect brick each day, yep. right? We're not trying to build the whole wall. I think that's, like, a Will Smith quote. But like, you're, <laughs> Quote you're it. Not, yeah, right? You're not, you're not trying to build the whole wall in one day. You just need to lay one perfect brick. And then after a year, two years, five years, ten years, whatever it is, you have this awesome wall. But, like, if you just look at a wall of a 25-year-old next to you, you're going to be like, oh, man, that wall is overwhelming when you have no bricks laid. But, like, when you're 12 years old, you have a lot of time. Like, he started somewhere, too. He didn't just wake up with this wall, mm-hmm. right? Like... It, it's so you just kind of have to attack it day by day yeah and i think that's another disconnect right is like we get so much good information out there and kids like to their credit they they want to utilize it but maybe a little bit inefficiently right so like they grab all of it and they go okay today i'm going to do all of this stuff when in reality like they did maybe not have gone about that like super efficient because they didn't grasp like the original concept like that's my, my thing is like take one piece right like one piece yeah and then let's let's go with that piece until we've gotten to a point in our process where you're like okay I can move on to the next piece that's why I, I love what you just said about the bricks and just to quote Will Smith one more time it was him <laughs> it was uh which what, what is the one where he's like he who says he can and he who says he can't are both uh, yeah. right <laughs> Fire yep. me up, dude. Fire me up one time. Yep. Gosh, dog it. I love it. But yeah, <laughs> but that's what it comes down to, right? Is like, I think to simplify like everything we're talking about is let's build the capacity, right? Like let's build the capacity first and then let's build on top of that capacity. So like instead of going the opposite where you have like all of the strength but you have no movement capacity, then it's like, yeah, you, you know, you're setting yourself up for injury. And I, and I can speak literally can attest to this because I blew out like I yeah. literally just had surgery because like maybe my movement capacity wasn't good and then therefore as you know athletes 
we're just so good at compensating that your yep. body like finds a way to get the job done. But it's not about getting the job done. It's about getting the job done like super efficiently. Um, yeah. No, I, 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 lo- I love where you're at. Um, I'm, I'm curious when you said, uh, actually, before I dive into one more thing, I want, you said force velocity curve. And I know that's, yeah. a, that's a huge component um, when, we, when we look at velocity and, 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 you know, in the baseball training industry. I don't know if I've ever like unpacked that on my show. So okay. would you mind doing that for my audience? No, no. Um, yeah, so, so basically the force velocity curve is if you picture like a graph and an x y axis you have this you have this curve and basically the the more force you produce the less velocity you produce and vice versa so think about it this way right when you're moving a 500 pound squat you're going to move it pretty slowly Mm -hmm. but when you do a vertical jump unweighted you're going to move pretty fast Mm -hmm. right and so we have these opposite ends of the spectrum so we have you know we have absolute strength so again one rep max strength and then we have absolute speed and then in between there, we have strength speed on the absolute uh, strength side. And then we have speed strength more towards the absolute velocity side. And so basically, you need qualities like pretty much all along that curve. But obviously, so throwing throwing a baseball 95, 100 miles an hour, wh- whatever your top velocity is, is the absolute velocity end of that curve. And we could even go into like um, supra maximal velocity. So it would be like under load balls, running guns, that kind of thing sure. um, would fall down there. And so what you generally see is guys tend to spend too much time on one end of the spectrum or another, right? So I get guys who message me relatively frequently are like, man, I deadlift 500 pounds. You know, I bench press this, this, and this. I can do, you know, this much on squat, whatever. And I throw 80 miles an hour. Like, what am I doing wrong? I'm Mm -hmm. like, well, I would need to know a lot more than just that. But like, I have an idea. Like, you probably spent too much time on that side of the force velocity curve, right? Like, you're working on force, which is awesome and necessary, but like probably not to the degree to which you did it. And then on the other end, you have young kids who come in who are 10 years old and all they've ever done is, you know, run, throw, swing, sure. which again, a 10 is probably fine. So, so let's move that up a little bit. Maybe you have a 15 year old who comes you in. You have a six year old kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> never, never touched a weight in his life. What 2019 for you right there. Yeah. Right. So, so you have, let's say you have a 15 year old kid come in. That's probably a better example. Um, who's, who's never, you know, lifted before he's, all he's ever done is, is throw, run, swing. Right. So he's he's been on the absolute velocity side of the curve the whole time. So we probably need to pull him back the other way a little bit and get him some strength, get him a force base. And then if his movements stay relatively the same. So we need to be we need to be conscious of making sure we're doing enough sporting movements along with the strength work so that the sporting movements don't get, you know, more robotic and whatever from doing too much, spending too much time in the gym. Um, then he's probably going to be a little bit better at, at running and throwing and all those things because he can produce more force still in a shorter amount of time, which is what we're talking about when we talk about power, right? So mm-hmm. if we kind of combine all of those qualities along there, then we have like a more complete athlete. So basically strength, speed would be like your speed squats, for example, or something like that. And then speed strength would be more like throwing medicine balls or like lightly loaded jumps or something along those lines. Um, and that's kind of how you would fill out a program. And basically going through an off-season period, uh, depending on the athlete, you're probably going to hit all of those points. Um, it's just a matter of, like, when you do it. Are you? Yeah, so like that's what I was going to ask. Are you segmenting that? Like, hey, this, this week we're going to uh, do like yeah, so, super fast movements? So, yeah, so there's, there's a few different ways to do it, and it really depends. Um, so there's, there's basically methods where you would train – basically all those qualities simultaneously and then there's methods where you would um kind of segment those things in with the idea being that those qualities kind of build on each other um and so i i generally um don't train the whole whole curve at one time um but pretty much we're always doing like fast athletic movements so i will train like basically farther to right on the on the force velocity curve which would be the absolute velocity side and i will still train like the high force stuff um, Probably per and, individual and too, though, right? It, it totally is, yeah. So I, I generally won't go any program where there's like no high speed movements for a guy, just because I, I think that it will make those guys like kind of too, too basically robotic with their movement. Like they need to jump, they need to run, they need to throw med balls, they need to do all those kinds of things to make sure that they can still move well. Um, mm-hmm. But they may also need to work on force a lot, so more of the focus would go to that. Uh, but, but it really, it, again, it depends on the guy, but, but yeah, I would say in general, most guys are working on at least a few of those qualities simultaneously, not just all one. Hey guys, I'm interrupting the show again. It's Robbie. 
Hi. Anyways, if you guys are interested in a potential discount for any of Oat Specialties products, head over to the show notes, therobbyroshow.com forward slash 083, and you'll uh, see an option there to claim your discount. But uh, Oat Specialties is a sponsor of The Robbie Rose Show. So I want to give them a quick shout out, but products including tap weighted balls, connection balls, bell clubs, med balls, um, throwing clubs, all of these great products available with a discount. Let's get back to the show. What uh, I w- I'm, I'm curious, like when you talked about uh, in the beginning of the show when you were saying about testing on yourself and you said that you had huge like velocity jumps when you identified like your sweet spot of your process. Yeah. Um, as far as like your biggest growth in velocity, what would you kind of attest that to as far as like what your example um, like strength and conditioning program look like? If you could give yeah. us a brief example. Yeah, yeah. So... So for me, again, like I said, I did pretty well on low volume. And and so for everybody listening who thinks like, oh, I might do well on low volume too, like I built a really significant base before I ever like pulled my volume back this much because once you have the base built, it's relatively easy to maintain most of those qualities, right? Yeah. So like it didn't take a lot for me to maintain my strength. It didn't take a lot for me to maintain my body weight. It didn't make, it didn't take me a lot to maintain, you know, those those other more general qualities. So I needed to do less of those in order to make sure that I could do more of the sport specific stuff, the throwing stuff, because that was what was really holding me back. Right. So in order to do that, I, I took my, when I made the biggest gains, I took my lifting down to two days a week. Um, and I was throwing, I was throwing like, I had three main days and then a, like a, a super light recovery day. So I would go like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday kind of thing. And so Monday and Friday were generally like high effort days. Um, Monday was like a super low volume day. So I might make like six to 10 high effort throws of like various drills, depending on what specifically I was working on then and like what ball weights I was using. Mm -hmm. But, but so that's what I would do on Monday. And then, and then Friday, by this point I was on the mound. So it was like a mound velocity day. Mm -hmm. So I would basically have like 20 ish pitches, um, at max effort and, and kind of record the numbers. Um, and that's, that's when like, I would just walk into the gym on a given day and I know that I'm going to hop on the mound and basically sit like 94. Mm -hmm. And, but again, this was like, that would have been, I would have been better served to do that during an in season period than I probably was while I was still trying to work on things. Um, because like I couldn't, I couldn't maintain that doing what I was doing and I wasn't doing enough like other work to maintain my patterns well enough. I was basically just like throwing hard and not doing much else. Um, so I don't think that was optimal, but that's when I made my biggest gains. So then I've kind of taken that and extrapolated that from there and tried to find out what's more optimal for me. Mm-hmm. So like my volume is still low on a given day just because of like the, the type of athlete that I am and basically the other qualities that I've built. So like I'll, I'll train generally I'm, I'm in the gym doing stuff like three to four days a week, generally closer to three, depending on like what kind of training block I'm in. Mm-hmm. And then I'm throwing those four days a week with maybe super, super light recovery days in between those days, depending on what I'm feeling like I need to work on patterning wise. Mm -hmm. Um, But I've gone to more like one high effort day because I found that I recover better that way. Um, So it just, it, you know, it it kind of varies, but, but yeah, um, it just, it's about identifying guys who do well with, you know, higher or lower volume. And then what you're doing outside of that, obviously if you're doing tons of skill work, they can't be in the gym like, as much as they are when they're in like their general off season period and maybe not throwing. Sure. So, um, so you, you mentioned patterning and this is something yeah. that I want to break down because I know a lot of people listening are, are hearing the word a lot, but maybe not like understanding the, uh, like what it actually entails. Do you mind breaking that down as far as like what you mean by when you say your patterning being off yeah. or whatever? Yeah. So, so basically no, not no two pitchers, really create velocity the exact same way, right? So, like, we know within a pitching delivery there are certain, like, KPIs or key performance indicators that generally are associated with high velocity. So, like, for example, like, hip-shoulder separation is one that everyone always talks about. Like, Mm -hmm. that's that's a pretty well-known one. But, like, not everybody has amazing hip-shoulder separation. Some guys do it differently, and they don't necessarily need that, or they can't physically because of, like, their their body structure or whatever it might be. Anatomy, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But... But in general, we have like a blueprint that we can work off of for most guys, assuming <clears throat> that like you find a guy who's of similar size to you or the athlete that you're working with and who throws from a similar arm slot and, and may have some of the same physical qualities that athlete, then you probably have a pretty good model to work off of. 
um, assuming no like major you know uh, mobility deficiencies in the guy you're working with, and then from there you can go and try to change certain pieces uh, within the delivery. So like it might be you know somebody's lead leg block is is bad, which would basically mean like when they land instead of so when you land your knee is probably going to be like a little bit flexed, but as or bent, but as you uh, start to accelerate your arm. What's going to happen is that leg is is going to extend more, so your knee is going to have less of a bend to it and more stiffness. So like if you see Justin Verlander, mm-hmm. right, he's got like a very famous lead leg block because he almost hyperextends, right? So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, he he does that super well. Um, so not everyone needs to look exactly like that, but if we if we see a guy who lands and then his knee kind of goes forward okay, towards his yeah. toes, like. He he's not he's not really getting anything from his lower body in terms of energy transfer mm-hmm. towards everybody as, as far as like what he could be getting if we firmed that up. So we might do specific drills to work on that because just telling somebody like, hey, yeah, I want your knee to be straighter when you throw. Like, right? What does that even mean? That's How the disconnect in the industry that? right there, dude. Yeah. <laughs> so so basically, we find constraint drills, which basically constraint drills are uh, you put people in specific positions and you provide the guardrails for a movement solution. So like if you give somebody a rocker, for example, right, Mm -hmm. there's only so many possible ways they can go from there because of the constraints you've given them. Or if you give them a roll in, for example, because pretty much everyone knows what those two drills are. You've only only given them so many movement solutions there. So if they stay within those guardrails and don't do anything crazy with the movement, then they're probably going to find their body's best movement solution in that given moment for what we're asking it to do, right? So in the case of rolling, we're looking for better hip shoulder separation. So assuming that they don't they don't go crazy with moving their back foot around or some other stuff like that, then we're probably gonna gonna find a better position from there, assuming they have the right hip structure for that drill or whatever. But but that's kind of how we go about patterning stuff is we give guys specific drills to do to work on these things, and then eventually we kind of blend that with the full pattern to make changes to like the pitching delivery, if they're an outfielder, the crow hop, whatever it is to kind of make changes there no so. i love it man because that's like talking about segmentation right like taking like bits and pieces of the actual exactly. yeah, delivery yeah. It's just, and then, it's yeah. Chunky. yeah right and i think that's like that's a huge piece to like the overall solution of of everything right because like it's, i talk about this a lot as far as like the actual delivery um looking at like from a biomechanic standpoint it's like usually you take care of one huge major component and one major piece of the delivery and you and you get that efficient and then a lot of other things will clear up right but it's about identifying sure. like that one piece like okay you know potentially his lead leg block isn't efficient because he's not getting into the right positions you know at separation a hand separation or like yeah. little tiny things like that but that's what I, I love man because it's like okay we have models of we know that Justin Verlander you know, like moves very good, and um, he's a really good guy to model after because obviously, look at like, you know, his prerequisites and everything yeah. that he entails. So it's about identifying like, okay, well, he does X, Y, and Z. Like maybe I should go. Okay, well, let's let's look at and see if I can mold my patterns. Not like super, you know, spot on, but it just gives us an example. All right, like okay, he separates here, like he gets into good patterns here, and he does this really well, which is all fine and dandy. I think the disconnect is like going one hundred percent down that rabbit hole of like I have to move exactly like this person because, like you mentioned earlier, everyone's going to have different capacities and everyone's going to move a different way. And uh, no, I just I just love what you say. And for the audience listening, man, like the if you take one thing from this entire podcast just take that every individual is going to be different right and it's it's about identifying at an early age um yourself really right like For sure. identify like pretty much what you suck at and and what you yeah. need to get better at and and yeah. and how to go forward with that um but but uh no dude i, I appreciate uh you saying that and and i I'm, i just looked up at the time and it's already at 38 minutes so i'm gonna in closing, I apologize if I said uh, we'd go only thirty minutes, but um, that's all right, dude. Uh, if you don't mind, take this opportunity to to tell my audience where they can find you as far as like your website, platform, social media platforms, and all that stuff. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, my website is tyleransman.com. dot com. Oh, that's simple um, enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then so basically on there, I have articles about. Uh, training you know generally specifically for baseball sometimes it's a little bit more general than that Uh, i have stuff specifically about throwing and how to train that and then i have specific stuff about nutrition and different ideas about that Mm. and then on instagram it's just tyler underscore ansman 
Um, on Twitter, it's the same. And then on Facebook, I have a Tyler Ansman performance page. Um, so any of those places will have, you know, probably a lot of my articles posted. Instagram will have videos of specific stuff that I'm working on or what my athletes are working on or whatever. Um, and feel free to, to reach out and ask any questions that you have. Yeah, dude, no, I, I, I dove into a few of your blogs, man. I mean, you do, you do a really, you do a really good job and I'm not just saying that because we're still on the air. <laughs> like on, honestly, like I, I, I really encourage my audience to go check that out because like I'm a fellow like blogging nerd about all of this stuff. So it's like, I, I respect the quality of work, right? Like when, when you're doing a piece and, um, I, I really encourage my audience, uh, all that, all that stuff can be found. Um, if you guys go to the show notes, therobbyroshow.com forward slash 083, I'll take you to the show notes so you can find all of Tyler's links and all of that stuff. But, um, Tyler, appreciate your time, man. It was, uh, it was a blast talking. I could talk shop, like talk about this stuff literally all day. Um, yeah, man, no problem. I so, appreciate uh, you having me on. If, if you need a, an episode two, I'm happy to do it. Yeah. I was going to say like, probably going to have you come back on and <laughs> in, in, in no time, but, uh, appreciate you, dude. Um, again, I apologize if I, I, I said, uh, uh, we cap it at 30, but, um, no worries. Thanks no for worries. taking the time, dude. And, um, I'll, uh, definitely get this, get this, all these links and all that stuff, uh, out to you whenever the episode airs. So appreciate okay, you, man. Great. And, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. All right. You too. All right, brother. Take care. All right, guys. Like I said, show notes, the forward slash zero eight three, the forward slash zero eight three. You can find all of the links talked about. You can find all of the potential discounts that you potentially can have. I just said potentially twice in the same sentence. I don't know if that's ever been done. If you guys have yet to subscribe, why would you not want to after I just used potential twice in the same sentence? Am I right? Dope. All right, guys. Until next time. Again, sorry. uh, I apologize. I just played back the audio. It sucked. Oh, well. Good information to be had, though. Much love, guys. Talk to you.